Welcome, my friend, to the world of the undead. Welcome to a war between two vampire clans. Welcome to a game of deduction, deception, and delicious tension. Welcome to Bloodbound. So each player in the game is a member of one of two vampire clans, and the aim of the game is to capture the leader of the opposite clan. The clever thing is, not only do you not know what the lead, who the leader of your op op opposition is, they might not know it either. Let me explain. Each, each player gets one of nine cards in each colour, ranked one to nine. But you get a random selection of the nine cards dealt out. Equal numbers of red and, and blue. And so, in fact, you might not get terribly low cards. So let's say you have a six-player game and these are the three blue players. Now, the number two might think, well, I probably am the leader, but in fact, she's not. And she won't know that at the beginning. All you know at the beginning of the game is your clan and your rank. Your rank also gives you a special power uh, when you activate it by taking the matching number token from this number line in the middle. You also have a couple of other tokens, and you take one of these tokens whenever you're caused, when you, whenever you take a wound, and that will give some information. Now, this, if this play, player was to take this token, that would reveal her affiliation as in the blue gargoyle clan, but this token would not give any particular information about her. The only other thing of, of note on the, on the cards, apart from the gorgeous artwork, of course, is this down on the bottom right. This is a little tiny clue that you give at the beginning of the game, so people don't end, start the game with no information at all. You take this handsome reference card, cover your own, own card, and show just this tiny little corner to only to the player on your left. And so everyone starts off with a little nugget of information from which they can build up to conclude who is the opposition's leader. Now, the leader is the opposition player with the lowest rank, as I say. However, it takes a while to work out who that is. The game plays very, very simply. If you just have a few players ranged around here, you simply take the knife, if you have the knife at the beginning of the round, and you give it to another player. Either blade first, causing them a wound, or hilt first, when you're just passing them. Presumably you think they're a teammate. Now, the only other thing that can happen, of course, if they take a wound, they have to reveal either a token, so perhaps they would put one of those in front of them, or they'd have to activate their secret power by taking a number, the only other thing that can happen is that a third player can offer to intervene. Now, the intended victim can either choose to allow that intervention or reject the intervention, and there may be reasons why that is. In any case, whichever player takes a wound and has to then take the consequence, then takes the blade and the game moves on. The game ends when one player takes their fourth wound and is captured. Now, the best way to understand this end game condition is from the point of view of the captor, the person who ends the game by causing that fourth wound. If that person causes a fourth wound and captures the opposition's leader, then they have won the game. If they have captured anyone else, they have lost the game. And that is the basic mechanisms of the game, which as you, I'm sure you'll agree are fairly simple. The flavour and to an extent the complication of this game comes from the roles and they are and they are deliciously thematic. The courtesan will give another player a fan which will prevent anyone intervening on their behalf. The mage will give other people a staff which will prevent their affiliation, to affiliation being revealed. The berserker will force anyone who causes them a wound to take a wound themselves, and that in itself can end the game. The guardian protects another player as long as the guardian himself or herself has not taken their third wound. 
the mentalist, or I like to say the psychic, because mentalist in UK English is not a great word, um, forces another player to suffer one wound and then gives the dagger to him. The alchemist is fascinating uh, and basically forces a player for whom she has intervened to take or heal a wound. The Harlequin is interesting partly because the clue card is misleading and this is a way of misleading other people, but also can look at other players' cards. The assassin is extremely powerful and causes another player two wounds. And the elder, this is almost my favorite. This is, the, this is obviously going to be the leader if you've drawn this card, except when you take their special power, you take the quill card, which changes the game because it makes not the lowest but the highest number, the leader of your clan. So you may not have thought that you were the leader, so you may have felt like you could just reveal your secret power willy-nilly, but suddenly the quill comes out and you are exposed. And that is fascinating. I love this game. This is, at this point, for six players or more, which is what you need for this game, this is my favorite social deduction game. This might even be my favorite game for an even number of players above six. Now, that's the key. It is not quite as good for an odd number of players because you have to include the Inquisitor, whose job is basically to, to guess the leader of the Victoria's clan, which is not a very interesting role. It just works really well. The dynamic works really well. The teams, uh, working out whose team you're on and the kind of dynamic of Who's, who's on what team works beautifully. A lot of people don't like social deduction games because there's this kind of, ooh, I'm not really the person that I said I am and I'm trying to pretend something and it's sort of poker face. And that's fun, but a lot of people have got sick of it and I get that. This does not feel like that. No one, everyone is trying to deceive everyone else, but everyone's doing it equally. So you haven't got that kind of pressure. And it looks spectacular. Of course, I've candle lit it. It's actually the best way to play it. But the art is amazing. The card art is absolutely beautiful. And actually, what I like about the card art is not just that it's in itself attractive. It's just, it's diverse. And what I mean by that is there are different genders, which is great different races, different sizes. Some of them are, some of the vampires are menacing. Some of them are kind of fey and delicate looking. And it sort of reminds me of the fact that the vampire myth is universal around the world and that vampires come in all shapes and sizes. So that in itself is just that beautiful little touch that this game has added. Now, of course, this came out in a first edition which had laughably terrible um, art and it's kind of a shame because that first edition came out during the social deduction craze was a great social deduction game but looked awful this one has come out is a great social deduction game looks fantastic plays brilliantly but has missed the boat there's nothing less fashionable than last year's hotness after all but overall, I would give this an 8.5. It would be a 9 if it wasn't for the fact that playing as the Inquisitor when you have an odd number of players just isn't as much fun. Absolutely stellar game. It does seem, unfortunately, to have slightly sunk like a stone, but if you can track down a copy, I absolutely recommend it. And if any of you are worried about my drink, don't. It's not alcohol. <laughs> Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com.